This video is a review of the rigid rotor chapter in the quantum chemistry and spectroscopy playlist. So we start with our rigid rotor model where we have a diatomic molecule and we have each atom of mass one and mass two. They're both rotating around their common center of mass at some fixed bond length R. So the Hamiltonian for this system is just the kinetic energy operator, so long as their bond length remains fixed, minus h bar squared over two mu del squared, mu being the reduced mass of these two atoms. And this reduces to the angular momentum squared operator divided by two times the moment of inertia, where the moment of inertia is the reduced mass times the bond length squared. All right, uh, very important in this chapter is rotational operators. As we can see, the angular momentum squared operator has a functional form in spherical polar coordinates in terms of r, theta, and phi. And we have the z component of the angular momentum, which is minus ih bar dd phi, where theta is the polar angle from the z-axis, 0 to 180 degrees, and phi is the angle of the projection into the xy plane with the plus x axis between 0 and 360 degrees. The rigid rotor energies depend on a quantum number j, which starts at 0 and goes up as an integer, and also what's called a rotational constant, b bar, which is Planck's constant divided by 8 pi squared speed of light times reduced mass times bond length squared. So as the reduced mass or the bond length go up, we are going to have B bar going down. And then the separation of each of these energy levels is primarily determined by what this, uh, what this rotational constant is. We also have the degeneracy of each level going up as we go up, starting with a singly degenerate ground state, threefold J equals one, fivefold J equals two, et cetera. All right, so we have these quadratically spaced energy levels. So for each peak, we're going up an additional, uh, an additional increase in energy. So from zero to one, it's two B bar. From one to two, it's four B bar. Two to three is six, et cetera. So we have a rota microwave rotational spectrum as a set of evenly spaced lines under the rigid rotor model, with our selection rule being that delta J equals plus or minus one. We can couple a transition in rotational states to a transition in vibrational states where we're going to absorb a photon and increase one vibrational quantum number, n, and we can go up or down one rotational quantum number, j. So the E in there is the harmonic oscillator energy plus the rigid rotor energy. This gives us rho vibrational spectra where we have a set of peaks at the vibrational frequency plus some increase due to increased rotational energy or down due to j equal delta j equals minus one in what are called the r and the p branch the shapes of each of these are determined by the occupation levels of each of those levels which is determined by statistical mechanics additionally for our vibrational transition we know that vibrational motions are not always completely harmonic for molecules so we can account for anharmonicity with what's called a rotation vibration interaction constant, where our rotational constant is now a function of our vibrational energy level. So as we go up in vibrational energy, our bond length goes up a little bit, bringing our moment of inertia down and decreasing our uh, rotational constant as we see in this formula. Also, we can have an increase in the bond length as we go to higher rotational energies due to centrifugal distortion, where we have a higher quantum of energy, goes to a longer bond length, lower moment of inertia, lower rotational constant. And that the extent to which that occurs is represented by the centrifugal distortion coefficient, d bar. Our rigid rotor wave functions are the spherical harmonic functions where h acting on our function is e times our function. And these spherical harmonics are a normalization constant times a polynomial called the Legendre polynomials of cosine theta, the polar angle, and then times an, a complex exponential in phi, e to the i m phi. These spherical harmonics are all orthonormal to one another, where if they don't have the same value of the quantum number j and m, they're going to give you zero when you integrate them, and they are normalized, so if you have the same j and the same m, they're going to give you one. And lastly, we have the eigenvalues of our two rotational operators for these spherical harmonics, 
When you act the total angular momentum squared operator, you get an eigenvalue of h bar squared j times j plus 1. And when you act the z component of the angular momentum on our spherical harmonics, you get the eigenvalue h bar m. Links to each individual video in the on-screen annotations as well as in the description below.